Good morning. Uh, for those of you in Spain, a good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Uh, I am Michael Skoll, president of the Venezuelan American Association of the United States, VAUS. As many of you know, VAUS has uh, morphed over the years from a bilateral business promotion organization to a determined advocate for the return of democracy, human rights, and anti-criminal behavior in Venezuela, a country, again, you all know this, which today re represents the extreme opposite of these values. We fully recognize how difficult this process has been and will continue to be, but we at VAUS are committed to bringing forward the voices of those who are actively engaged in the effort. Today, uh, we are uh, doing something a, a bit different, a, a focus on US policy and frankly, uh, the notion that something has been missing in Washington, perhaps a dozen years now, the kind of strong principled international leadership which remade the world after World War II. What, what's missing then? A bipartisanship, a common sense of the national interest, an understanding that what happens outside of the country directly affects our well being inside? And how does all this relate to Venezuela? To, to answer these questions, we're turning to a new group, the, the Vandenberg Coalition, named after Arthur Van, Vandenberg, the senator from Michigan, who came to symbolize the bipartisan spirit behind our successful post war foreign policy. Uh, I, I remember uh, Arthur Vandenberg from, uh, from uh, reading uh, history and, and meeting with people who, who knew him, but I, I'm, I'm wondering how many people today really uh, uh, know who Va Arthur Vandenberg was, what he represented, and how important uh, he was. Let me uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, uh, Kerry Filippetti is the executive director of the Vandenberg Coalition. Uh, prior to this, Kerry served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Cuba and Venezuela in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, that's my old place, and the Deputy Special Representative for Venezuela at the U.S. Department of State. From 2019 to 2020, Kerry also served as Senior Advisor to the Havana Incidents Task Force, where she was responsible for coordinating an interagency effort to address the causes of unexplained health incidents affecting US personnel and identifying proper long-term care mechanisms. Miguel Pizarro is a Venezuelan politician, deputy of the legitimate, repeat legitimate National Assembly of Venezuela. Uh, he is also the commissioner to the United Nations Organization and commissioner for humanitarian aid, appointed by the interim government of President Juan Guaido in 2019. He represents the, uh, the people who are uh, both legitimate, uh, democratic, and recognized by um, uh, the United States and most other uh, legitimate countries around the world. Uh, Marshall Billingsley is a former Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing at the United States Department of the Treasury. He previously served as a U.S. Senate staffer and as a senior Department of Defense official. Now, while this is our conversation is going on, please note that at any time you may post a question for our panelists by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Don't click chat, click to Q&A. Now, let me pass the mic to Kerry. Kerry, tell us uh, about the Vandenberg Coalition and how it relates to the Venezuelan crisis. Sure, well, thank you so much, Ambassador. It's, it's great to be here and to be with um, two folks that I've worked a lot with um, over the years, Miguel and, and Marshall. Um, so I, I, I think you really framed it well, Ambassador, that what we have found is missing um, right now in policy when it comes to Venezuela is the sense of strong principled international leadership coming from the United States. Um, you know, why we wanted to focus on, you know, Senator Vandenberg is because when you look at um, his life, and you mentioned he's a senator from Michigan, he served from 1928 to 1951. So this is in the immediate aftermath of World War II that he had most of his Senate experience. And at one point he was also the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, and 
what we try to do at the Vandenberg Coalition is to establish and promote American leadership based on the leadership of Senator Arthur Vandenberg and the principles that he advocated for, which really do fall into this category of strong, principled, and international. Um, the purpose of American leadership in his mind was not solely for the sake of other countries or solely for the sake of the United States, but that in fact, the safety and security of democracies abroad would therefore mean the safety and security of the United States. And he's a particularly interesting figure because he was not always supportive of an internationalist policy. He in fact began as an isolationist. Um, and then when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, he recognized um, that quote, our oceans have ceased to become moats that protect our ramparts, essentially meaning that borders are no longer enough to prevent actors who are determined to get to us here in the United States. Um, so he really had uh, four principles that I think are especially relevant to US policy when it comes to Venezuela. So I'll talk through those four principles, um, how they relate to Venezuela, um, and then I'm happy to hear the rest of the panel discussion. So first and foremost, one of his core principles was recognizing how external threats seemingly disconnected from security at home really do matter. Um, and so what I mean by this in, in, in Arthur Vandenberg's lifetime, as I said, he, he started as an isolationist and then he realized that while we should not, as John Quincy Adams said, go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, if there is a monster that we know is abroad that has its sights on us, we should probably do something about that before they end up getting to, um, to our borders. And when it comes to Latin America and Venezuela in general, I think you see a lot of national security interests that fundamentally affect the United States. And this is why the Trump administration, which was not known as being a particularly multilateral internationalist um, administration, did care deeply about what was going on in Venezuela. Um, we saw the uh, preponderance of transnational criminal organizations. Obviously in Venezuela, the Maduro regime retains its power through illicit sources of financing, narcotics being one of them. Um, and of course, the United States is particularly concerned about um, the drug trade and how it affects both our borders as well as the lives of people you know, really across the United States. And then most importantly, we have China, Russia, and Iran trying to use Venezuela to get a foothold into, um, into our neighborhood. And so recognizing how Venezuela really matters to the national security of the United States is a key component of having an effective foreign policy coming from the United States when it, when it comes to Venezuela. The second key principle that Senator Vandenberg argued for was the importance of international alliances. Um, so once again, Venezuela is a perfect example of this, really trying to use multilateral treaties, bringing it to the attention of the United Nations, um, bringing the Rio Treaty back into use um, in order to try to establish some kind of consequences. And then of course, the role that Brazil, Colombia, and other allies in the region played in trying to create a force multiplying effect. Um, the, the Excuse goal me, here could, you, could you just uh, um, explain what the Rio Treaty is? So oh, sure. Um, yeah, the Rio Treaty is, uh, it's a really interesting um, treaty that was established as sort of one of the, it's essentially, for those of you who are familiar with, um, with NATO, it's essentially a, a mutual defense pact, a, a mutual cooperation pact in support of democracy um, that includes countries in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and so the Rio Treaty had been utilized in order to provide for the common security of the Western Hemisphere, but had not been um, invoked in the organization of American states uh, for many, many years uh, prior to us deploying it when it came to Venezuela. And the idea is not just military cooperation, the idea is cooperation on sanctions. Um, the idea is really making sure that the people of Venezuela recognize that it is the community around them, the neighborhood around them that really cares about their safety and their security and, and their rights. Um, and the idea is of course that the United States needs to promote the sovereignty of others, but we mm -hmm. also need to be using our deterrent capabilities in order to bolster democratic actors. And so that combination of supporting the efforts of the country and its citizens, in this case, Venezuela, but also making sure that we're uh, marching you know, uh, uh, alongside them. Uh, the third 
value that I would mention um, that Vandenberg believed in is uh, using all the tools of national power that we have at our disposal. Um, and I think a good example of um, Vandenberg's use of this is the Marshall Plan, um, the idea of really trying to reconstruct and refinance Europe following World War II, not because the United States was doing so well economically, but because we recognized in the importance of bolstering Europe in order to provide for our own security. And so I think actually Marshall uh, Billingsley here will have a lot of um, answers to how we were able to use creative strategies and need to continue to use creative strategies um, to deter the Maduro regime, whether that's through foreign aid, through the use of sanctions, through the use of freezing of assets, and then of course, through public di diplomacy uh, as well. And then the fourth major principle is bipartisan consensus. And Ambassador, you mentioned this at the start. Um, we do have this still on Venezuela. It's shifting a little bit. I think people are hoping to see more leadership coming from the United States. That's partially you know, my purpose in, in having this conversation as well. But it is something that does tug at the heartstrings of all Americans who recognize in the fight that Venezuelans are putting forward for democracy in their own country, a similar narrative as, as the fight that we experienced in our country fighting for uh, liberty and freedom um, at our founding. Um, so broadly, you know, what Senator Vandenberg was arguing for is the importance of strong U.S. leadership in support of democratic actors abroad in an effort to preserve U.S. interests and national security. Um, and I think that is precisely the strategy that uh, we should continue to try to implement when it comes to Venezuela. Thank you very much, Kerry. Miguel, do you have... Um... Uh, more to say about that, There's specifically about the uh, the Guaido government's um, uh, reaction to uh, to um, what Kerry has just uh, talked about, to the the notion of a strong U bipartisan U.S. policy. Thank you, Ambassador Skoll, and thank you everyone for being here, and Kerry and Marshall for being part of this conversation. We are really thankful as Venezuelans for all the work you've done during your administration, and, and I'm really pleased of being here. First, um, as a first reaction to what Kerry said, I believe that one of the most important things for us as Venezuelans and for the Venezuelan struggle in general is the consensus. Having everyone on board for us is a matter of supreme importance, and not only uh, regarding U.S. politics is speaking about consensus in the broader term and what we mean about consensus. Everyone by this point should agree that Venezuela is living under a dictatorship. It's not a, a weak democracy. It's not a Caribbean kind of political experiment. It's a dictatorship. Everyone should agree by this moment that Venezuela, Venezuelans live under a huge, massive violation of human rights and that it's a decision of the people remaining in power to use all the tools of the power against their own population. Everyone should agree by this moment and after everything we know that Venezuela is the worst humanitarian emergency that our region has seen in the last 50 years at least. And that's an humanitarian emergency that also is created by political decisions. It's a man-made crisis. We are not having um, the number of people in need because we have a civil war or because we had a natural disaster. This has been because of corruption, because of the kleptocracy of the regime in the power, but also because of the social control design the regime have inside of the country. And everyone should agree by this moment that Venezuelan solution is not only a political electoral solution. We understand and everyone should understand that that's one of the key components of any solution in Venezuela, but our situation is way more complex than only thinking in when are we going to vote or what are the electoral conditions for that kind of election. And I will give uh, for the people in the audience a brief summary of where we are as a country. Venezuela is a country in which right now we have 6.1 million of migrants and refugees. We're going to be 8 million by the end of this year if the trend continues. That means that one of every five Venezuelans are not living inside of the country right now. One of every five are being forced to leave the country to look for food, to look for medicines, to look for job opportunities, to run away from human rights violations. Venezuela is a country in which the ones inside, we have 7 million people in need. According to the latest humanitarian response plan from the UN that was updated in 2019, that was the last, like to say in a certain way, official number we have for people in need, we have 7 million of Venezuelans 
in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. And that means that one fourth of a population inside of a country needs assistance for the basic means of living. A regional country, the fourth gold reserve in the world, one of the biggest exporters of diamonds and mineral, we have one fourth of a, of a population under this condition. We have more than 200 political prisoners, not only politicians in prison, we have members of the army, we have right, high rank members of the intelligence and counterintelligence. We have people who were loyal to the regime that deflected from the regime and now it's leaving a political prison under the worst circumstance. But also everyone and, and is part of, of this assessment right now should understand that Venezuela is not only a political problem. Venezuela is a safe haven for, for non-state armed groups, Venezuela is a safe haven for drug trafficking. Venezuela is a safe haven for these, I, I, I like to call it like a league of evil internationally, but if you want to see all the problems the US have, all those problems are right now in Venezuela. Russian influence, Iranian influence, Chinese competition, the control over our economy that the Chinese and the Russians have, the control over our intelligence that the Cubans have, the influence in the international framework that the Iranians have is not the same that Venezuela had in 2018 or 2017. The evolution from the regime, from moving to an old school Caribbean dictatorship that was depending only on the Cuban regime and the Cuban influence, moving now to this sort of hybrid regime in which they have Cuban cooperation, but they are the embassy in this side of the world of the Iranian, the Russians, and a lot of the bad business that are in the world is what we are trying to explain as where we are right now as a country. And why this explanation is important? Because it's really easy for everyone who is not following us on the daily basis to get confused between two things that we believe are absolutely unfair. When we are out of the news cycle, when we are not part of the CNN, Fox News conversation in the US, people here start to believe that everything is getting solved in Venezuela that since we are not part of the new cycle, since long we, our crisis doesn't have enough spotlight, things are getting better, that we are having maybe political openness or the humanitarian situation is not that bad. And that confusion that is absolutely common in our situation is absolutely unfair for our struggle because maybe we are not in the new cycle, but the situation in Venezuela is not getting any better, any better in any of the aspects I, I just uh, said. But also I try to make this assessment because the common approach to Venezuela until now has been only speaking about the electoral solution. And we agree that the last day on the of the regime in the power is going to be the day the Venezuelans are able to vote freely. But to arrive to that election, we have to do a lot of things today, not tomorrow, not in 2024, not at the end of 2023, we have to do it today. And what today, why today? We force the regime to go again into the table for the Mexico talks. We force the regime to go uh, into a new round of negotiations. And what happened with the round of negotiations? The same that had happened before. First, the regime never engaged in goodwill. The regime is open to have like cosmetic conversations, but not going into the root of the, of the issues or trying to make real changes to what this power structure means in Venezuela but also there's a common approach in the international community towards our negotiation. Everyone made a lot of pressure to force the negotiation. Everyone invest all the political power and diplomatic power in taking the regime to the table. But once negotiations start, everyone try to give space to the regime. And in that logic that we need to give space to the regime for them to engage in goodwill, the regime lose all the incentive to be in the table. The only way to have a real negotiation with Maduro's regime is forcing them to the negotiation be the best option they have. And to do that, we have one part that we have to rebuild inside of a country and we totally understand it. We need more mobilizations, we need more demonstration, we need to rebuild our grassroots presence and that was the importance of participating in the fraud election of November 21st, but also we need a common understanding from the international community. And I mean, this sometime gap that exists between countries and governments that if we don't apply all the pressure we can in the same moment, we are building all the incentive we have, the regime is never going to engage in real talks. And why I speak about negotiations, Ambassador? Because 
seeing the international community and what's happening in the world, it's clear that our, the only solution we have is engaging in talks. And it's trying to persuade people on the regime to deflect or to break the dominant coalition inside of a country. But to arrive to that point, we need more tools. And those tools are not only the ones I spoke about the internal participation and mobilization, those tools also are the will from the international community to do everything they can to force the regime to engage in goodwill. Right now, the regime feeling is that they don't have any cost if they step off the table, that they don't have any consequence if they continue doing what they're doing. And how we prevent that? I believe we have good experience and we have bad experience, but what one good experience is when everyone goes in the same direction like we did in the Human Rights Council in the past two years, and we passed a resolution sponsored by the region with the Lima Group, but also with the support of European partners and the US and Canada, building a special mechanism called the fact-finding mission and forcing a new accountability way inside of the UN. When we had this kind of good experience where all the countries build the case against the, the regime in the ICC, and that, action in the ICC build the rest of the investigation that now we are having in the country of Venezuela is the only country in the region who have a president in exercise, usurping power, being under an ICC investigation. This is not happening anywhere else in the region. And that's a good base, a, a, a strong proof that we have crimes against humanity in the country. But also we have had bad experience. The approach to electoral process in Venezuela needs to have more consensus. We understood in November 21, and with this I will I will close my opening remarks, that we were going into that election as a testimonial way. We didn't went to that election thinking that we were going to win 20 governors, 300 mayors, and all the city halls. We understand the system we're fighting against. But we went to use that small frame of, of like allowed politics inside of a country to rebuild grassroots and to try to make from that moment a better mobilization internally. And everyone spoke at that moment that we have the best electoral council, that these were the best conditions ever. Even there was some sort of narrative trying to call us hardliner for demanding more. What happened yesterday, yesterday, just 24 hours ago, the regime killed the possibility of half a recall election the way they designed the science recollection, the way they designed the whole system for people to be able to say they want a recall election to, short, to shorten the period of Nicolás Maduro was killed with an administrative decision in which made mathematically impossible to reach the number even having the people. The same electoral council, the same guys leading with the election. Why I say this ambassador? Because if we understand that we need an election and negotiations as a solution, we have to embrace reality and we have to stop only thinking what we want to think because reality is way harder than the wishful thinking that sometimes we have in the narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Yes, what happened yesterday was uh, was brazen to the extreme in terms of uh, uh, telling people they had, um, uh, um, I exaggerate slightly, five minutes to get a million signatures. Um, it's not that much of an exaggeration. Uh, let us turn now to uh, Marshall Billingsley. Marshall, um, um, what do you have to say? Well, you know, to pick up on your initial comments and those of Kerry, and by the way, it's great to be on with uh, my old friend Kerry and with Miguel. Um, it's good to see you um, both. Uh, but in terms of your comments on bipartisanship and what Arthur Vandenberg stood for, uh, I must say that during the Trump administration on the topic of Venezuela, uh, you know, I had outstanding support from members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Uh, there was strong support from uh, Senator Bob Menendez, from Dick Durbin uh, and others, uh, as well as from uh, Republican members like Ted Cruz and, and Marco Rubio. Um, and, and that, I think, the policy that the Trump administration adopted in refusing to recognize the, the Maduro regime as a legitimate government based on their theft, not just of the election, but the creation of a completely fraudulent, fraudulent constituent assembly to try to you know, remove the National Assembly from its role and, and so on and so forth. Really, we had a coherent plan. 
but you know, th there's a saying in Washington that elections have consequences and boy, do they. Uh, this past election, presidential election has had consequences, not just for the American people and our economy, but for the people of Afghanistan, for it appears now the people in Ukraine, but certainly for the people of Venezuela, <clears throat> because I can discern no coherent administration policy towards Venezuela or Latin America more broadly. Uh, I see an administration that um, uh, with a secretary of the treasury, Janet Yellen, who can't be bothered to discuss sanctions uh, or even to discuss the national security missions of the treasury uh, in a way that uh, Steven Mnuchin you know, spent half his time on those issues as the secretary of the treasury. I see an administration that has not yet imposed a single new sanction related to Venezuela. I see an administration that is not enforcing the sanctions that we put on the books. Uh, and the result is that today Maduro is stronger than he's ever been in the past five years. Oil production continues to grow because Iran is giving unfettered help supplying diluents uh, and, and purchasing uh, crude. Likewise, China and Russia continue to, to provide their assistance. Uh, in fact, oil production has more than doubled in Venezuela since Joe Biden took office. Nearly two three thirds of the regime's budget this year is gonna come from that increased oil production. And people are now projecting that the regime will grow, of course, they'll steal all of this as kleptocrats, but the economy is gonna grow by 5.2% this year. The ecocide in the Orinoco belt uh, related to the illegal strip mining of gold uh, continues. The kleptocracy is in full swing. Miguel mentioned the narcotics trafficking. But there's a new dimension which is highly concerning that has occurred on Biden's watch, and we need to keep our eye on this. And that is the rapid increase in both the Iranian and Hezbollah footprint in Venezuela. Uh, this past April, the number two in Iran's Quds Force, which is their terror apparatus, uh, the number two in that organization, who also was their point man in supplying ballistic missiles and weaponized unmanned aerial vehicles to the Houthis in Yemen, as well as to Lebanese Hezbollah, died of a heart attack. But before he died, he had begun traveling repeatedly to Venezuela. So why exactly is the top Iranian general who's in charge of proliferating weaponized UAVs to terrorists showing up in Caracas? It's only 2,500 kilometers or so from Caracas to Miami. And the Iranians claim to have UAVs that can reach in excess of 7,000 kilometers. I, I believe we may see very soon the introduction of weaponized systems capable of reaching the United States <clears throat> under the command and control of trained Hezbollah operatives. Hezbollah has been flowing into the country uh, in, in unprecedented levels. And this regime will very, very soon pose a very, very real physical threat to the American people, in addition to all of the other threats they pose to international peace and security through their destruction of democracy, through wrecking a country that, as pointed out, had the world's highest oil reserves, proven reserves, fourth largest gold reserves, and in terms of human capital, had the best, most literate, well-educated population in South America. If this trend continues, then a number of things will happen. We will face an Iranian Hezbollah-based threat to the United States from within Venezuela. Russia and the, its Cuban proxies will fully cement domestic control. China will re-enter economically and Venezuela will again resume bankrolling uh, as it did under Chavez and as it did under the early years of Maduro, will, they will resume bankrolling anti-democratic, anti-American socialist dictatorships around the region. So the prognosis here is not great. I agree with Miguel that it, it's frustrating to see how little airtime the plight of the Venezuelan people are getting, but I believe that's largely because the, the string of foreign policy catastrophes that we've suffered for the past year has simply made it a crowded playing field. Thanks, Ambassador Skoll, and uh, look forward to the discussion and any questions the audience has. Yes, thank you. Let me uh, remind people, um, if you want to ask a question, uh, click the Q&A 
button, uh, write your, um, your question, and then we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, let, let's, let's, let's get global now, um, uh, Marshall, uh, uh, building on what you've said. It seems to me there's a lot of parallels between uh, what the US may or not, may not be doing in the Ukraine uh, and what the U.S. may or may not be doing vis-a-vis -vis Iran and how those affect Venezuela um, directly. Uh, uh, it strikes me, for example, that, uh, um, and, and the, the Russians have even said this, that, uh, that they, they want to uh, challenge the U.S. in our own territory as if, as if they are saying, and I assume they are saying, that the U.S. is challenging Russia in its territory, meaning, meaning the Ukraine. Um, so this is, this is a global phenomenon, and it is a global um, question about where U.S. policy uh, is going. Uh, and and it, I think it pretty much, you have destroyed one of the mythologies of the past year or so, that, the, there, that there is a bipartisan policy today toward Venezuela that, that the, the, and I re, you read it almost every day in the New York Times that the um, um, uh, Biden administration policy on, on Venezuela is the same as the Trump administration policy on, on Venezuela. And it's just simply not true. Um, the, the, that, that's one of the problems we face. How, how do you and, and uh, uh, Carrie or, or, or Miguel react to the, this idea that the Venezuelan problem our problem with Venezuela is a um, is is an integral part of um, of U.S. worldview uh, all over the place. Well, I think that's exactly right, and I'd offer two points. One is that um, Vladimir Putin took Joe Biden's measure in June of this past year during their summit in Geneva, and whatever conclusions he drew from that meeting. Clearly, one of them is that Biden is a weak and feeble leader and is an American president who will not stand up to Russian aggression or further aggression in Ukraine, which is why he's massing more than 100,000 troops uh, on the border and attempting to coerce NATO on, on, it, on a large number of topics. That, I think, will inform Russian decision making in terms of how it interferes across Latin America as well. Secondly, uh, as, if, if you think that the, or if you agree that the lack or the failure to enforce the previous administration's policies is leading to dramatic and rapid economic strengthening of the Maduro regime in Venezuela, it's multifold the case when it comes to Iran and the concessions that have been made, the non-enforcement that has been made, uh, the allowing of South Koreans, uh, Iraqis, and others to pay hard currency into the Iranian regime's coffers. And we know what that results in. That results in funding of terrorism and adventurism around the globe. Uh, and we have seen the terror apparatus that the Iranians operate uh, receive new influx, uh, new, new influxes of cash. You saw the Houthis just uh, uh, attacked Abu Dhabi with UAVs. Um, Hezbollah is stronger than it's ever been, uh, particularly now that the Lebanese economy is imploding. And you have all of these bad actors now fully resident in Venezuela. So this is a toxic stew that is, that is boiling here. Uh, and it's going to put, frankly, this administration in a very difficult position in the next year or so uh, if some of these uh, trends are not reversed. Ambassador, I would just quickly add, you know, foreign policy has been described as three-dimensional chess. And the reason I, I raise that is because something that happens in one region has consequences far beyond that region. Afghanistan is a perfect example of it. Um, you know, we saw China try to make more incursions into the Middle East as a result. Um, and so I, I think, I, I will say, I, I do still think there's a consensus among Democrats and Republicans, at least in Washington, that what is going on in Venezuela needs to have a resolution. The issue is there's a difference between having that objective in mind and then, you know, and having consensus on that objective and then having consensus on the tactics to achieve that consensus. And if I could describe the difference between, you know, the current administration's policy on this and um, 
and the Trump administration's policy on this. And I think this is true also as a differentiator between the Trump administration's policy and European policy is that um, more use of things like sanctions, um, you know, and that kind of tool is a deterrent for war, not an invitation to it. That was how we always viewed it. This was why we would focus on things like sanctions and asset freezes and so on, not as a mechanism or justification for a war, but as an effort to hopefully prevent it. And so, you know, I know that the Biden administration has the same objective of wanting to see a, a democratic resolution to what's happening inside Venezuela. They want to prevent the uh, eventual use of any kind of military force. Um, I think there is just a difference between, you know, viewing some of these tools as an invitation to war when in fact our administration viewed them as, um, as a deterrent from war. Uh, Ambassador, I think you're isn't, okay. Yeah, isn't it true that um, the, the sheer volume of uh, support for the Venezuelan regime, which uh, comes from Iran, it comes from uh, Russia, it comes from China, a uh, few other places, uh, absolutely demands a greater response from uh, from the U.S. Uh, uh, it. it um, as of right now, in my opinion, um, we, we ought to be very pessimistic about the future of, of Venezuela. The, um, um, our enemies, uh, China, Russia, Iran, um, are doing a far better job of coordinating than, uh, than we are. Uh, they have a far greater presence. And um, for us to think that mere rhetoric and, and, and a few things are, are going to help, I just find it um, absolutely scandalous. The, the, the changes over the past few years have been uh, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I, we lived in, in, in Venezuela from 1990 to 1993. And um, um, I, when, when I read about the Venezuela of today, I, I don't recognize anything, anything in, in, in the, uh, the, the country, a, a couple of buildings maybe, but that's, but that's about it. It's, it's an extraordinary um, concentration of power um, uh, exercised by our enemies uh, against democracy, against Venezuela, and against, and against us. Um, any, any comment about my diatribe? I would jump in, and then I, I'm curious to hear um, uh, from the others. But you know, I would say, yes, I mean, when it comes to the kind of great power competition aspect of this, Russia, China, you know, Iran, US, um, I definitely think that we're not using the, the tools that we should be using, you know, at our disposal. There is another actor here, um, which is the most important actor and is the reason why I'm, I'm not necessarily, you know, pessimistic about Venezuela, which is, you know, the Venezuelan democratic actors themselves. Um, and, you know, having served in my position in, in the last administration, the reason why I was inspired to work on Venezuela in the first place was because of early meetings when I was at the U.S. mission to the U.N. with, you know, students from Venezuela who were doing unbelievable things to try to fight for freedom in their country. So it's definitely incumbent on the United States to do more to support and empower those actors, but it is those actors that do give me some sense of, of optimism that, you know, there is still this thread of support for democracy in a country that many other countries would have just completely given up on the fact, you know, seeing how challenging and, and how much of an uphill battle it is and how many of their friends and neighbors and, and family members are leaving the country. And since that has not happened yet, and we have actors who are fighting on a daily basis for their country, um, that's where I get my optimism. Even if I do agree with you on the great power competition side, um, you know, the United States is definitely not doing as much as it could be to use its, its tools of uh, national power. I hope you're right. Uh, let, let me uh, um, add another aspect of a uh, post um, Cold War, post uh, World War II policy, and that was uh, one part of it. Obviously, is the opposition to our enemies, and, and in that case, it was uh, the Soviet Union. The other part was strong support for our allies um, in Western Europe. Um, it seems to me that the um, the parallel would be um, support for countries like Colombia, uh, 
Uh, it would uh, seem to me support for Venezuelan refugees wherever they are. Uh, and um, it strikes me that there is not enough support from the US and from its allies um, for places like especially Colombia and for Venezuelan refugees wherever they are uh, in Colombia, other parts of um, um, South America, uh, the Caribbean and, and the US. Uh, any comment on that? Yeah, Ambassador, in, in that, I, I have to admit that the leadership of the U.S. has been really important. The U.S. is the biggest donor we have in the humanitarian response inside of a country. Uh, I will give you like concrete examples. Without the USAID support during 2019 and 2020, uh, it was impossible to vaccinate kids in the normal immunization campaign in Venezuela. So in the last two years, the only vaccines we have for child against measles, smallpox, yellow fever is coming from international cooperation. The biggest donor also in the regional response for Venezuelan migrants and refugees is um, the US among the European Union. And, and I believe that that's a perfect example, Ambassador, of leading by example. When we started this whole uh, process in, in Venezuela, we said in 2016 that we were living on a humanitarian emergency. And a lot of people in the world were, were seeing us like crazy. In that moment, we have one of every eight kids growing in the, in the way they shouldn't because they didn't have access to enough food and medicines. It was until 2019 when the UN and the humanitarian system recognized that we were under an humanitarian emergency and was the first humanitarian response plan for our country and the first time we were part of a global humanitarian overview. And that happened in a big way because of the US support and what the US did inside of the UN system and all, with all the humanitarian partners to move this in the right direction. But also we have a good experience of building humanitarian agreements. In a country in which both sides are not able to find political solutions, we were able to build minimum common ground to unfroze money to pay for vaccines or to pay for uh, UNICEF operations or IFRC operations on the ground. And that kind of precedent in which the OFAC was instrumental because this money held here in the US in which we coordin coordinating with OFAC and with the US government, we are able to mobilize it to humanitarian agencies or humanitarian partners on the ground. That precedent of using money that is froze from corruption or froze from the kleptocracy and putting into the uh, humanitarian assistance account or into direct ca cash transfers to help personal is something that the US did, the US continue doing, and we believe it's a really important path to follow. Just one more thing about the, the trends Marshall and Kerry were speaking. In 2020, only 5,000, a little bit more than 5,000 Venezuelans crossed the border, the southern border here in the US in a, some sort of illegal or informal way. Last year, that number was more than 108,000. That's an increase of 100,000 people in one year. That refugee and migration trend that was walking from my country down south, now it's walking from my country up north. And maybe, uh, sometimes here we don't have attention for what is happening inside of the country, but I believe that that new reality in the southern border and what's happening with, with the Venezuelans is going to force a, a new kind of conversation. And there's a question of kid minds here for me, but I don't know if you want uh, me to answer it right now. You're muted, Masar. There. Okay, here's a, um, a question. From, uh, from Keith Mines, uh, mostly for Miguel, but others as well. What measures do you see in the coming year to build greater opposition unity? Hannibal Sanchez noted that with full unity, the opposition could have, have won as many as 10 governorships in November. Is that true? The, the current plan seems to be to insist that unity means all sides joining the unitary platform. Might there be a more inclusive approach that allows for more diverse opposition with shared leadership? Yeah, briefly to, to that. First, um, thank you, Keith. I, I don't agree with superficial analysis of the electoral situation in Venezuela, just seeing numbers or political alliance. And I mean that because not everyone who disguised as opposition is opposition in my country. And there's people and there were candidates in November 21st election that were designed 
only to divide the the opposition vote or only to build or strong or make a stronger the perception of deep division inside of the of the opposition in the country and a perfect example of that is what happened in the second round of election in Barinas in the repetition of election in Barinas all the parties were together all the opposition were together and the same guys who called themselves the democratic alliance had a different candidate Claudio Fermin who not even live in the state and his only role in that election was to speak bad of the opposition and say that he was a third way a more conciliate softer third way that half a chance so i don't believe we can make a rough analysis of like if everyone were together we were having term more governors i believe and i agree with keith that opposition needs a, a wider base and that wider base, and we have, sorry for speaking about internal politics that much, I don't believe everyone is going to understand this, but we are coming from a way of coordination that is, was mainly the four bigger parties. And we are evolving from that situation of only having the four bigger parties taking decision to a unitarian platform in which we are trying to have dissident chavistas, in which we are trying to have members of civil society, minority parties, and the biggest parties that we are we have right now representing in the National Assembly. Maybe it's not perfect. And I, I agree that sometimes changing this kind of coordination ways is not easy for internal purpose. But I believe a good support that people outside of Venezuela can do to Venezuelans is helping to build this kind of space. When we start to be part of internal discussion from outside and not helping the wise, the ones inside to be coordinated, to have consensus, to have common ground, to do politics together, we are also being part of the problem. And I believe that a, a strong tool that the US, the Institute for Peace, all the implementers can give here is provide all the assistance and all the support to build a stronger base in the opposition because we have a good opportunity. I believe that the worst part of internal discussions is over. And now the discussion should be What's the political path to follow and how we can force the regime to have negotiations while we put the people in the center of all the action. And that means more humanitarian agreements, more humanitarian assistance and trying to open some, court of, some sort of uh, relief for people suffering. I, I just want to quickly add on to what um, Miguel said, and I, I agree with how he laid it out that what the U.S. can do is really to try to help create this unity. Um, because I, I agree, Keith, on your point, and, and hello, it's great to hear from you, um, on your point about um, needing unity. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's a single member of the interim government um, that ever spoke to me who didn't at some point hear me say that they need to focus more on getting Maduro out than on any kind of infighting between themselves. Absolutely, unity is the most important part of, of this entire process. The only thing that I disagree with, um, and I think this won't surprise you, Keith, is you know the idea of winning 10 more governorships as a result. Well, the opposition did win other governorships, but that didn't mean that the person who went into power there was necessarily an opposition leader. And, and Barina State is, I think, a perfect example of this. Obviously, then they you know, continued to win and there was not much else that the regime could do, but they did try to use these disqualifying tactics and so on. So the, the issue is all of the tools of power are currently still in the hands of the Maduro regime. So when you talk about things that everybody should support, an electoral process, a negotiation, humanitarian aid, you have to be mindful of which of these things are fully under the thumb of the Maduro regime? And how is he potentially going to manipulate any well-intended effort in order to use those things to, to accrue you know, incremental democratic change? And, and, and that's a key that thing that um, I think both you know, the Trump and Biden administration um, need to be uh, worried about and, and, and focused on. Let me, let me also please hear that um... You know, I, the opposition, the infighting within the opposition has really, really been counterproductive and it cost us uh, enormous momentum at multiple junctures. Uh, on top of that, um, Maduro, and it's not Maduro, but he's not sophisticated enough to, to, to do these kinds of things, but he is surrounded by some highly intelligent people, including the Cubans. And he has used people like Raul Garin and others to compromise members of the opposition, to develop compromat by providing financing, funding, so on and so forth. 
Um, and um, I think we may, as the trial of Alex Saab unfolds, we may learn more about some of those bribery efforts. One final point, when, when you talk about the unholy alliance between Russia, China, and Iran and what they're doing in Venezuela, let's recall that the one thing that really unifies these very, very different regimes is their absolute uh, de detestation of democracy. Uh, they do not want to see democracy flourish anywhere in the world, and they are determined to undermine it uh, at every juncture. And they will do that not just in, in Venezuela, uh, but they will attempt to do that in the upcoming elections in Colombia, where Duque, I think, is at serious risk of losing to a FARC candidate. Um, uh, and if that happens, uh, you know, we, we, will, we will see Colombia take the quick and deep slide in the same direction as Venezuela. Yep, I agree. Uh, here's a question from uh, Antonio de la Cruz. It's been partially answered, uh, but I think it bears um, looking at again. Uh, if the regime of Nicolas Maduro is an international criminal corporation, what tools does the international community have, especially the Biden administration, to solve the political crisis? Because so far, the proposed solution is the electoral route that we know Maduro and his henchmen control. Anyone? Um, I'll jump in, but I, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Miguel's perspective um, on this as somebody who's, you know, affected by, um, by some of these decisions, but um, I think it's a great question. I, I will say one, one other key difference between um, how the Trump administration and the Biden administration view this um, is the Trump administration was very much about, we need a full solution sort of at the get-go, like to have a negotiation process at all, we need to know that Maduro is willing to put his own presidency on the table. Um, and the Biden administration is viewing it as a more kind of incremental approach. Um, now, obviously, I was in the Trump administration. I think their approach, you know, that approach was, was obviously, you know, partially a brainchild of mine. But I do think it's useful to try a different tactic since that one didn't, wasn't effective. So I will give, you know, some credit to trying to look at this in a, in a different way. Sometimes change is what's needed kind of regardless of in which direction that change is. Um, but I think it's a great question because, again, the tools of electoral control are under the thumb of the Maduro regime. So that's why I fundamentally don't believe in electoral process in and of itself is what's necessary. So a few things that I think could potentially be useful here. Um, and again, this goes back to two key principles. Um, one of deterrence, basically preventing an actor from doing something because of the threat of something worse to come. Um, and then accountability, which is more or less penalties for them doing something anyway. Um, and so you need a combination of both deterrence and accountability factors in order to be successful in your strategy. And that was what we tried to do in the last administration. A few things that we can look at. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, break from the Trump administration in one aspect, which is I actually do believe that the ICC prosecution is an important element of, of, of this. Um, now, I say break because there are a lot of concerns that the past administration, and I share those concerns, have about the ICC in general. But those concerns are ultimately about the politicization of its um, its decisions to, to um, prosecute uh, or not. Harry, uh, just tell people what the ICC is. Sure, sorry, I've become one of those DC people that just throws around. I, I, I swore to myself I wouldn't become this. So I, I appreciate you um, uh, saying that. So it's the International Criminal Court. And there is a group of, I believe it's five countries um, that pushed forward a potential prosecution of Nicolas Maduro um, within the International Criminal Court. Um, the United States in general supports the ICC. Um, the previous administration, the Trump administration, had concerns about politicization of their prosecu prosecution process. Um, but I do think that the ICC is an important tool, if actually used, to hold the Maduro regime accountable. Um, I also think that, you know, Miguel mentioned the, the fact-finding mission. I think it's fantastic. I think it's done unbelievable work, given us amazing access to some of what's going on in the ground would have liked for the UN to be able to push for a slightly stronger um, initiative. So there's different levels of UN you know, human rights investigation. One is a fact-finding mission where they basically go and 
find facts. The other is a commission of inquiry known as a COI. And that's a sort of slightly higher standard that has more built-in accountability measures. It would have been fantastic, will be fantastic if we can ever get um, the, the UN to approve that, again, as an accountability measure. Um, I also think a critical step is to, for God's sakes, convince Europe to implement more sanctions and asset freezes. This was a major concern of ours when there was a um, you know, sanctions and travel ban on public officials from the Maduro regime. We saw them on the tarmac in Spain. Um, we see the children of Maduro regime officials partying in Spain. You, you will hear me keep saying Spain because it, it is a real concern for me. And I know many of our audience is in Spain right now. Um, we need to make sure that Europe is actually preventing that illicit income from getting into their countries the same way the United States has done that. So that's a major multilateral initiative that we can do. Um, I agree, you know, based on the last uh, conversation, you know, the question that Keith raised, you know, empowering the opposition, empowering the mobilization, making sure that we're focused on not just getting Maduro out, but how we're actively helping the people of Venezuela at the same time, because they need to see the interim government as a viable alternative. And the interim government is not going to be a viable alternative unless they are actually providing something to the people of Venezuela, whether it's humanitarian aid. You know, this is the kind of stuff that, that Miguel and his team work on um, all the time. Um, I also agree with Miguel on keeping the media involved in this. This should be something that we talk about on a regular basis, both in the United States and internationally, particularly where there are strong Venezuelan expat communities. Um, I think we need to have more penalties on countries like Russia, Iran, and China, specifically for their interference in Venezuela. We did some of that in the last administration. We did not do enough of that in the last administration. Um, and then I think the most important, which I saved for last, is we have to just reset the baseline of not accidentally empowering the Maduro regime. I completely understand why people want us to see a negotiation process. I completely understand why we wanted to see a um, European um, observation mission out of the EU. Um, but we knew that the election was not going to be free and fair. And so when you, when you authorize these things, you're inadvertently and very unintentionally providing power you know, to the regime and, and sort of sanctioning, and I mean that in the sort of positive sense of sanctioning, allowing um, the regime to have a patina of legitimacy. Um, so, so that is what I think should be really emphasized is if the EU doesn't want to implement sanctions on human rights abusers and on those who are potentially committing crimes against humanity, that's the European Union's problem. But at the very least, they should not be empowering those things to be happening by having a, a inappropriate baseline that, that actually empowers the Maduro regime over and above the opposition that's fighting on a daily basis to provide for the people of Venezuela. Okay, there's um, um, time for one more question. Uh, Martin Schubert has asked two. I'm gonna um, um, use his second question, which is a little bit more explosive uh, and, and use it as a, um, uh, a, a ticket to ask our three panelists who, um, for any, any summary for um, what we've been discussing today. Martin asks, is the Monroe Doctrine a dead issue or only a historical term? And someone else asks, is the Lima group dead in the water? Anyone? So the Monroe Doctrine is far from dead. Uh, it was alive and well under the Trump administration. Uh, and uh, in fact, we had explicit discussions uh, at the National Security Council on that very topic. The challenge is that for such a doctrine to be enforced, you have to have a president who is willing to issue a credible threat of military force. Uh, it, it, it is beyond surprising to me that we're in this situation with Venezuela today when in previous administrations these dictators would have taken the baby Doc Duvalier, the Amel de Marcos, pack up her shoes and, and, and get out pathway. And in fact, there was a moment where Maduro was quite close to, to doing exactly that. The Russians told him to stay put. Uh, I have no illusions that this administration, uh, given what I've seen uh, in Afghanistan, given what we've seen unfolding in Ukraine, that this administration would, uh, 
would put such a, a, a threat out there. But uh, it, it is noteworthy that we were dealing with far, far less in terms of what Noriega was doing in Panama uh, before his removal compared to what we see Maduro doing with all the narcotics trafficking, uh, uh, the roles that his senior leadership are playing as narcos. Uh, and then as I, as I keep coming back to the introduction of a terror sponsoring regime and a terrorist apparatus, Hezbollah, uh, into the country, there should be some red lines uh, regarding what we will tolerate in terms of the introduction of UAVs or ballistic missiles into that country. Uh, and unfortunately, because we're not employing financial tradecraft to avert the necessity for hostilities, we are inadvertently increasing the likelihood of armed conflict down the road. Miguel? Yeah, a, a couple of comments on the, I, I will match both questions, the previous one and, and this one, but about what international community can do understanding what we understand from the regime. I believe first we need a, a big, big consensus about the understanding that presidential elections fair and free elections is only going to be a consequence of a deeper process. It's not going to fall from sky. It's not something that the regime is going to suddenly give away in 2024. And they're going to wake up saying like, hey, maybe I have to open my country for democracy and give a real presidential election. The only way to have a real election is by forcing the regime. And, and you have a phrase here in the US that now I copy and I'm trying to make rough translation in Spanish that is carrot and stick we need to rebuild the system of carrot and stick related to the Venezuelan situation. Because right now also, there's no a clear view of what are the incentive from the regime to engage in a, in a real good conversation, real, real negotiation. What are, we had in the, in the past, the framework of the sanctions and the transitional framework, which gave a, a clear guideline that if they gave uh, the CNE, that means this kind of sanctions, if they open for elections, this means this kind of decisions in the US. But that framework right now is kind of blurry. And I believe a good way to build incentive is to show them what's at stake and what's going to happen, how the, the world is going to keep them accountable if they don't open the country for a democracy, and also what's the carrot, what, what's there, there for them in the case they do it, because that now it's not clear right now. Second. I believe that it's important for international community to close the gap. And I will use a more diplomatic term than what Kerry did. But closing the gap between the Europeans and the region is really important. And closing the gap means common understanding of NSAFs, common understanding of Russian, Iranians, and Cubans' influence, and common understanding about negotiations and how to arrive to this. Having three or four ways of negotiation is never going to find a solution for my country. We need one channel, one way, one effort. And the last two points, and with this I will close, providing more humanitarian assistance. The only way to have a country who demonstrate, who raises their voice, is if we take the people out of the survival mode the regime wanted. The regime wants to be the only provider. The regime wants to be the only one giving domestic gas, giving food, giving medicines. In the same way, we increase assistance inside of a country and we make the people free from that social control of the regime, we're going to have a stronger base of mobilization and political engagement. And the last point was raised in different occasions during this conversation, but it's opposition unity. It's it's really important for all international actors to help us to remain united. I know that everyone outside of Venezuela have a favorite different Venezuelan politician. Some people like the more hardliners, some people like the more moderate, but picking leaders is not the role of international community. The role of international community is to help us to remain united and to have a clear way of fighting. And let us, the Venezuelan, to pick who are our leaders and who are the ones representing us. Thank you, Kerry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up Miguel's point with a less diplomatic interpretation of, of what he said, which is, um, I, I, I tend not to use the phrase the Monroe Doctrine, but given that was the, the point of the question, I agree with Marshall, it's absolutely alive and well. We, we care deeply about what happens in our neighborhood because our national security is dependent on that, as we talked about at the very beginning. Um, and the point of the Monroe Doctrine was explicitly to prevent the colonization of this hemisphere by other powers. Um, now, the critical issue in Venezuela is an issue of 
Maduro's leadership. But we do see colonization as well. We see attempts at colonization from China. We see attempts at colonization from Russia and Iran. They are really trying to turn it into a instrument of their power to wield against the United States. Um, that's known. Um, it is also a, there is a bit of a colonialist um, sentiment that I think comes from Europe. Um, and what I mean by that is, once again, you know, what I have seen is that the European Union has not included the Venezuelan interim government in its discussions about what is happening in Venezuela. Every country should be involved in this because it's a matter of national security. But the Venezuelans themselves need to be at the center of the conversation. And if you are making decisions for another country, a sovereign other country, without listening to the leadership that you yourself recognize, then that is not, that is a form of imperialism. Um, and that was my biggest concern with the way the European Union, and I don't speak for the Union as a whole, I speak for certain actors within the Union whose names I mentioned previously. Um, if you're making those decisions for another country, then you are basically being imperialist. And so the best thing that Europe can do right now is actually pay attention to what the interim government is asking them to be involved in, not on what they, with their brilliance, believe is best for the people of Venezuela. Thank you. And I'm um, glad I'm not in government anymore because that kind of non-diplomatic statement would never fly. And I'll certainly okay. never be confirmed for a European position at this point. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned colonization. You know, there's a new book coming out uh, next month from Moises Naim um, of, from the good old days in, in Venezuela, in, in which he, he talks about the Cuban colonization of, of Venezuela, a very in interesting uh, concept. Um, thank you, Kerry, Miguel, and Marshall. Very interesting. I, I leave you with, um, and everyone with one, one thought. Uh, faced with the situation today in Venezuela, what do you think um, uh, Arthur Vandenberg would have advocated? What, what would Harry Truman have done? What would John F. Kennedy have done? We, we don't have to go all the way back to, um, to James Monroe. Um, we have, we have the, the, the recent memory of the kind of bipartisan, strong U.S. leadership uh, that, that um, uh, some of us remember and, and others would, um, would uh, benefit from reading history if anybody is doing that these days. Anyway, uh, I would like to thank also our hardworking associations team for making this event and all of our events uh, possible, Lina Delgado, Linda Calvet, and Lauri Dominguez. Uh, we have plans for more programs and we'll, uh, we'll let you know about them. If you are not already a member of the Venezuelan American Association and are interested in joining, please contact our team via the invitation. Again, thank you all for participating. We look forward to seeing you again soon, both panelists and participants. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you, take care.